Let's go. I'm on a journey to discover the truth. Living life in recovery is lovely. You got the power in you. Surround yourself with positive energy. Judges hitting people with provocative penalties. Need to make a change. Advocate to change the laws. Prove the people that it's not insane. When you stand behind a cause, I'm here to speak about the pain. Recover loud to normalize the disease that's been killing all my friends and my family. The time is now to let it all go and recover loud. The benefit is healthy people, family and friends that never have to overdose ever again never have to plead out to a lesser offense i'm proud to say that i recover loud i never thought i could but i'm so proud that i discovered how to live my life again controlling my own destiny i needed recovery i still need it desperately addiction never defined my identity. i recover loud here to tell my own story i recover proud save a life of like 40 i recover loud yeah i recover loud i recover loud yeah I recover loud, I recover loud, here to tell my own story. I recover proud, save a life of like 40. I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud. I recover loud, yeah, I recover loud. I recover, 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 I recover loud. Imagine that um, that behavior was different um, than it was when he was growing up. Um, you know, we we become master manipulators um, during our addictions, and we hurt people you know that we care about, and, and we really don't intend to. Um, as I was mentioning to you earlier, I don't have experience with losing a child, um, but I've been that child. Um, so I, I do appreciate your perspective on these these questions, uh, and I hope that uh, the viewers will will get a better understanding of, of what it's like um, to raise a child with substance use disorder. Um, if we could back up, sure. at what age, um, or maybe what year was it that you found out that Andrew was using? 2013. Uh, he was using prior to 2013, but in 2013, um, my mom was in a nursing home in Van Buren, and I said, hey bud, let's go up and see Nani and I'll take you with me because you haven't seen her yet. So he said, yeah, so I went to go pick him up. He gets in the car and he looks at me and he was honest with me. And I have to just say, he always called me mommy. I always says, mommy, because I was mommy. So he said, mommy, it's like, I have to tell you something. He's like, I think I need help. And I'm like, well, what do you need for help? He's like, I think I need recovery. And I'm like, what are you doing? I know that you're smoking pot. He's like, no, it's worse than that. So me, being blindsided, I had no idea what to do. I drove around where he lived, and I drove around the block, I pulled uh, back in front of his apartment, and I said, you need to get out of the car. He said, why? I'm not going to see Nani. I said, no. I said, I need to figure out what I need to do to help you. And um, I dropped him off, and then he was very upset. I heard him that day. And he, he actually wrote in one of, I found a Facebook post that he wrote about how um, he went home and cried because he didn't want to hurt me or his family. So he was living with his dad, so it was, you know, he was a daddy's boy too. So. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure just learning that was painful for you uh, and not knowing what to do in that moment was painful. Absolutely. So, what was it you did um, after that uh, to try to help him? So, um, when I dropped him off, I went and I made phone calls. I called, um, I, I called doctor's offices, I called um, agencies. I'm like, I need help for my child. And at that point, he was sort of struggling even more, and he ended up in, in Acadia. Um, we had three different evaluations in two days sorry <laughs> and um and by the last time when the, he came out holding a knife to us the police came and brought him to the hospital and they brought him to Acadia and he was um withdrawing in Acadia one-on-one -on -one in an isolation pod you know and we weren't allowed to go see him because he was not stable at that time yeah and did you say that was 2013 mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And, you know, we've learned a lot since then. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, back then, I don't know if anybody even carried Narcan. Mm -hmm. um, so it was, I mean, it was a different world than, than it is today. You know, even in 2018, when I decided to get help in Caribou, I, I had nowhere to turn. I didn't know where to turn. Um, there were resources, um, just nobody had ever told me where they were. Yep. Um, and, you know, that's the, the purpose of Recovering Loud, is, is so that people know that recovery is possible and there are ways to do it. It's not an easy conversation for parents to have with you. Uh, it's, I remember my mom, when she was dealing with cancer, getting her prescriptions. Um, she knew that she was wrong. Um, we'd never had the conversation. But when I'd ask her for some pills, she would know what it is. And, uh, you know, she would actually give me some. And, you know, I went through, I went through a lot of guilt and stuff with that. But I think if I'd had the conversation with my mother then, you know, it, it could have been better. You know, she could have helped support me in a better way. Um, than just, you know, not wanting to feel sick or in pain. And, and I remember I used to manipulate um, to get those. But, um, so, over the years, you said you did lose some friends. Yeah, I've uh, lost quite a few. First was my uncle, which was when I was 18. And I think I hadn't started using yet at that point. But... His death was related to drugs, and he had been using for quite a while. So that was before I even used, and then after using, I mean, I've lost quite a few, mostly people that I wasn't super close to, but there were some that I was really close to, and I have tattoos for them. <laughs> um, and then I have one friend that was the worst, that was just over a year ago and he had been sober for a year and a half or two years came up here to visit and overdosed in my bathroom and none of us thought he was using so we found him way too late and there was nothing that we could have done so I was maybe eight months clean at that point and I felt terrible. I felt that guilt of like I could have found him sooner and I was in my bedroom which is just across the upstairs and didn't hear anything and it really bothered me. And I've gotten over it more now but it's still really hard but it is what pushed me to completely stay sober. I saw... So you didn't relapse? No. I saw how that hurt me and my mom and his mom. They were all there. Well, his mom came shortly after we found him. And just seeing them and seeing what they were feeling and feeling it myself made me never want to put my mom through that pain yeah. again. And it... I don't know if I would have relapsed after that or not if I hadn't been properly medicated on mental health medication or if I hadn't had my mom to support me or all of those things, but I'm here, I didn't relapse and I try to tell people about it so that they know about it. It just really affected me and he had been sober for a long time and I want that to help because it helped. Yeah, and you know, in the recovery community, we, we deal with loss all the time. Um, might not be somebody we're close with, but we've met you know, a lot of them along the way. And for myself, I use it as fuel to keep going. Um, you know, because that's one person uh, I see an overdose death today as preventable. You know, we do have Narcan, there's the uh, Good Samaritan law, people can call 911 now. Uh, we didn't always have that. Uh, in the past, but today there's lots of ways that, that we can help. Nobody goes through this life perfectly. Right. Um, you know, and uh, it's it's how we go through life, how we deal with those problems as they arise that really build our character. Yeah. Um, me, I, I learned to hide. 
I turn to substances, um, which at some point you must have done. That's um, exactly what I did, yeah. <laughs> um, so at what age did you first start using something? Well, um, I was probably 12 or so when I started, you know, kind of understanding what marijuana was, started smoking marijuana, um, which kind of led me into drinking here and there, and then I started smoking cigarettes, and it was really made when I got into my freshman year of high school, and I kind of had this anxiety, depression meltdown, and I had no idea what I was going through. I didn't understand it. All I knew was I just didn't want to leave my house. <laughs> yeah. I was really young, you know, and I couldn't, I didn't understand what it was I was feeling, but just that I was terrified. Um, so I ended up actually homeschooling my first year of high school. And that was, that was kind of really a dark, dark year for me because I kind of just isolated because I didn't know how to deal with it. My parents tried to obviously get me into counseling and things like that and wanted to start me with some mental health uh, medications and stuff. But Did that happen? or I tried, I tried some medication for a little bit, but then I didn't want it, you know. Um, and then I kind of, I worked through it, and then my sophomore year of high school, I went back to school. And that's kind of when um, prescription drugs became a big part of my life. <laughs> um, you know, I remember the first time I tried a drug, I thought, this is the feeling that I've been looking for. And I found happiness. You know, I found this thing that made all my problems go away, and all these feelings that I was feeling that I didn't understand just disappear. You know, and I grew up in Stockholm. I had no idea what the stuff was or what it did. I just right. was with a group of friends, and we did it, and that was that. Yeah. Um, fortunately for me, though, I, I was able to kind of not get so wrapped up in it. Um, somehow, I don't know. <laughs> but yeah. I watched a lot of people that um, I went to high school with and that were my group of friends go down a completely different way with it. Um, so I'm very grateful that that, you know, I did experiment it with it, and I started it, and I think it's what kind of led me into my main problem, which is alcohol. Yeah. Um, you know, once I hit college, I kind of just felt like, well, I can't be doing the illegal drugs anymore. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, my degree was criminal justice. Um, so I really kind of was thinking, well, that's not why, so I'll just stick to drinking. Because um, drinking is, you know, socially acceptable, and right. a lot of people do it. Um but it was not good for me. Um, yeah, no. Alcohol kind of turned me into somebody I didn't even recognize. Um, and I didn't really start getting bad until after I turned 21. I started blacking out. Um, I wouldn't remember what I did or what I said. Um, I would have people telling me the next day the things I said to them, and I would say horrible things to these people. Things that I couldn't even, you know, and the things I would do and... You can never take that stuff back once you do it. Um, and for a while, like, I was okay with it because I'm like, oh, you know, everybody gets blacked out and drinks and has a good time, and that's, you know, that's not a big deal. Um, but it turned out being that eventually, after a lot of trials and errors, <laughs> I, yeah. I realized it's, it was the alcohol that had to go, you know. Um, can I ask, um, where did you learn to drink like that? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question, Mike. Um, well, you know, drinking was a big thing in my family. It was. Um, you know, my parents would come home from work and they would drink. And when we go on vacation, it was good to, you know, drink and have a good time, those kinds of things. And I think I just, I wanted to have way more of a good time. <laughs> For yeah. me, I couldn't stop. Yeah. And see, when I, I started drinking at 12, and it was at family functions. Yeah. And I wanted to be like my aunts, aunts and uncles that lived on the lake and had the boats. And, and um, you know, they would drink every weekend from the time they got up, yep. you know. And um, so I learned that drinking was, you know, as much as you could drink until you threw up or passed out. Yep. Um, and then as I got older, you know, that caused me a lot of trouble, you know. Uh, being at the bars in Canada, passed out on the bar. Um <laughs> You know, until last call when I was woken up and handed the keys to drive back, you know. Um, those crazy things happened, and I didn't know that I was drinking wrong, you know. Right. I, uh, I, I felt the same way. Yeah. I felt like I was doing what everybody else was doing. Right. You know. There was and no difference. Right. So when did you notice that it was a problem for you? Well, um, I think I knew for a while. I think you start to understand after a little while that you, then you start to justify it in your brain like you know it's not right but then you're like well no well, you know right. um, probably by the time 
And when I graduated um, college and I started to black out almost every time I was drinking. And the things I would say become more hurtful and the things I would do would become worse. And I was driving my vehicle home and I had no idea how I got there. Um, you know, who knows the people that I'm very thankfully I haven't, but I could have hurt driving my vehicle like that. Yeah, we know that, um, you know, quitting alcohol cold turkey can cause, lead to seizures mm -hmm. um, and be dangerous for people. Did you have any problems when you quit? Because the big thing for me was like, it wasn't like, it was getting there. You know what I mean? I hadn't, I was always a, a binger more than I was an everyday drinker, you know. But it was getting to that point. It was getting so bad to that point where it was either I had to find another solution or I was going to end up, yeah. you know, having to drink all the time. Yeah. Um, you know, and I remember, like, when I got sober for those two years and I didn't have a program and had anything like that. I just kept thinking, I can do this and I'm fine. Um, the reality of it is, is that bad things keep happening in yeah. life. You know what I mean? Not yeah. every, not everything is always happy, no matter what situation you're in. Right. Um, Getting rid of the substances don't doesn't make the world stop. It doesn't. <laughs> so I realized that the hard way. Mm -hmm. But for me, it was how I learned how to cope with my issues. So when that relationship fell apart and, and bad things happened, I thought, what's going to help me get through this? Well, the alcohol. That's what's going to help me get through this, you know. Um, and so the drinking became a real issue, and I ended up, I, I quit my job with AMHC, and I decided I was going to go get some help. So I ended up in rehab in Florida, okay. and um, I wanted to get as far away from here as I could because I blamed here. It was Arusa County. It was this place. It was, I soon realized it was me, and that it wouldn't yeah. matter where I went, it was going to yeah. still, I follow myself, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah, I I actually helped um, you know even my own kids understand that yeah. you know if if there's a jerk everywhere I go, That's chances true. are I'm the jerk. Right. So uh, I know in my experience uh, we did a lot of digging to find out you know what led us or what brought us to using substances in the first place. Uh, were you able to do that? Uh, all kinds of digging at the farm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, what'd you find out? So um, basically. Uh, it's a, it's a lot. Uh, I started out because uh, I was always around it. Like my family was always partying. Um, that that stuff seemed normal to me. So the first time I I tried a prescription pill, um, it, I didn't think anything different of it. You know, uh, my brothers always used prescription pills. Um, I never had my father around. I always looked up to my brothers, so of course I was going to do what they were doing. Yeah. Season. Yeah, so it was around you all the time as you were growing up? Um, the substance that alcohol was, like, my mom always went to the bars, they always had parties. Uh, my brothers were, like, when, when my mom was out to the, to the bars, uh, my brothers would babysit me or whatever, you know, and uh, obviously they were either drinking or using some type of substance. Um, I remember the first time I, I saw my brother snort a pill. I was kind of amazed by it, like in awe of it. Uh, yeah. it. I always thought he was cool and stuff, you know, so yeah. uh, when I saw that, I was like, oh, what's this, you know? Um, of course, he wouldn't let me use it at that point, but... Yeah, so how old were you when you first saw him do that? Uh, when I first saw him do that, I was probably about eight or nine. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, of course, when we have older brothers or, or you know, family members we look up to, you know, we try to do what they were doing. And, yeah. You know, so um, that was the normal, everyday stuff for you. That was normal, everyday stuff for me. Yeah. Um, and, and like I said, I didn't think anything different of it. Right. Like, I didn't think that that was a, a toxic uh, family until I actually went to rehab. Yeah. Yeah. So, what was the first time that you did try something? Uh, the first time I, I tried something, I was 11 years old. Um, most people try weed. The first thing I tried was uh, prescription pills. Uh, besides alcohol, uh, I tried alcohol uh, like when I was a lot younger, but alcohol never really was my thing for the most part. Like I could drink and stuff, yeah. whatever, but <laughs> prescription pills was uh, the first actual uh, friend, I guess you could say, that, that I had. Uh, my friend had back surgery in seventh grade. Um, sixth grade going into seventh grade I always hung out with him uh, so he was 
got prescribed uh, the blue hydrocodones. So that was the first thing I ever tried. Yeah. And uh, do you remember what it was like? Oh, it was terrific. Yeah. Like, it, it was great. Like, it made me feel uh, invincible. Mm. It took away um, all the pain that I had at home. But yeah. And then slowly it doesn't. Uh, so after that first time you tried it, was it an everyday thing? Um, it was a, a slow build up at first. Yeah. Um, I'd say like really after my mom passed away is when uh, when it really got bad. Yeah. Like obviously I was using on and off, um, but it wasn't um, like I could could always stop or, or yeah. whatever. Uh, I was selling stuff before then, you know, yeah. always getting money and stuff. But as for an actual. Um, addiction that's when it really started yeah. so your addiction started or the addiction really kicked in after your mom died in 2014 yeah um and uh you said your father wasn't around then no but, okay so you didn't know where to turn you didn't have that family support uh the or only person you? i had was missing really but um to this day i, I guess i can I, I still never grieved her death Hmm. Um, which is probably something I should work on. But. Yeah, it's tough. I mean, I lost my mom right around the same time. And uh, it was right after Christmas. And, you know, I, I remember I was using pretty heavily at that time already. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget the day when she looked up at me at the hospital and told me that my grandfather was in the corner and wanted to say hi to me. My grandfather had been dead for 20 years. Um, I was pretty high and I wasn't seeing that, you know, so I'm convinced that her guardian angels were there to take her. You know? Yeah. Um, and, you know, just having that experience, I, I had some guilt for a while after that, you know, and I didn't grieve my mom's death either. Um, it wasn't until recovery when my grand passed and I, I grieved both losses at the same time. Yeah. He was in the Marines for six years. Six years. Um, thank you for your service. Um, I know I mentioned it earlier, my son is a Marine right now, um, you know, and I, I have concerns, you know, what he's going to see when he goes out, you know, not necessarily all the time that he may not come home, but, you know, what's going to happen when he does come home, um, you know, and turning to substances is a, a way that a lot of people, veterans, um, end up coping with the, the trauma of, of being assigned duty, you know. Um, so, how, how, uh, how long did you use for? I used from the time I was 18 until March 12th of 2021. March 12th, so that's your recovery date. That's my recovery date, that's my last drunk and my last suicide attempt. Yeah. Um, how bad did that get? Um, I had just lost a job. I went to my house and grabbed a shotgun and wrestled with mom over control for it. Got control of it because she was Air Force, I was a Marine. You know, one of us had a clear advantage over the other. Um, I got the shotgun and took off down the road with a handle of Jaeger and uh, was pulled over before I made it two miles heading towards the lake because every suicide attempt I've made, I've tried to be somewhere beautiful. So that the last thing that I saw was a positive thing. To start out, um, you said you haven't used substances yourself, is that correct? Yes, yes, yes. I, I've never been directly, um, I guess you would say, in the midst of doing it. Um, it's always happened around me, uh, closest friends, family. Um, it's always been kind of in my life some way or another. Uh, somebody's affected by it. Addiction's always been around in my family as well, <clears throat> my mom. You know, how I, uh, you know, she, she worked through that and um, addiction kind of can come in all forms, I feel like, you know, and I, uh, being around it, I've seen a lot of different perspectives. Um, so what led you to start using substances? So um, after high school, I mean, I was dabbling in and out of like pills, like sorting pills was like a really big thing, even like 
back in the day. It was just like, you know, cocaine or like pills and stuff like that. I ended up getting stuck on some of that. Um, I dabbled on and off. Um, but it wasn't to the point where like, if I stopped, I was sick. Cause I was just kind of dabbling. It wasn't like an everyday gotcha. use type of thing. Yeah. Um, so that was like the kind of first start of me messing around with heavier drugs and of course like I smoked tons of weed as a teen and stuff like that. So were the pills more of a party situation for you? No, it was more like, I don't know, I just wanted them yeah. and it just seemed yummy at the time yeah. and it was like, you know, Percocets and Vicodin and stuff like that. And, and the people you stuff. were around, everybody was doing it Yeah, well. everyone was doing it and it was just like the type of thing where like you're in it, you're sitting there and you're like... I do it and right I just do it and then but you don't know that that ends up con it causes a dependency um, and then I got clean from all that was doing really well had an apartment um, then you know got pregnant for my daughter had my daughter and then after my daughter I ended up getting stuck on payments that they gave me for childbirth so I ended up getting stuck on that and then when there was no more like I got sick because there was nothing so then I just basically started going to like street drugs, which was for me, it was the heroin, which is street drug. So um, you, you got into heroin pretty quick. Pretty, pretty quickly. And it's, yeah. I would say, um, like after I was doing Percocets for a while, um, it was easier to get right into heroin as odd as it sounds because the dependency was kind of already there because it was a higher milligram pill. So when I first started doing it, and I didn't even know what heroin was, right. my girlfriend was like, oh, you should get this. It's cheaper. You know, just do that and you can have it longer. And I had no idea what it was. Right. No clue. Never even even focused on what that was. And where were you living at that time? That was still Rhode Island. Okay. Yeah. All, all of my drug use happened in Rhode Island. And then I moved to Maine in 2015 to get clean and to, you know, start basically a new life because I had lost custody of my daughter at that time. Um, and so what else, um, what did that uh, addiction to heroin do to you? over time I uh, ended up overdosing three times on fentanyl that was laced in it and I was in a my third overdose I was in a coma for six days on life support wow. so the it's just it's super easy to die from it really is it's all chemistry it's all based on your body weight and if you have too much you know, it's a medication, literally hospitals use fentanyl for pain management for surgery. So I was, I was actually prescribed fentanyl for quite a while Yes, and, uh, it was easy to get hooked on, mm -hmm. um, the feeling, uh, it, if you're using it for pain, I was prescribed it for mm -hmm. pain and it worked, it worked. Great. It works phenomenal. You know, it's amazing. Uh, yeah. Um, but it's just so quick to fall in love with because yeah. it's the effect that it gives you with these downers, it just gives you that euphoric feeling like you're floating and you're invincible and nothing can hurt you and you're yeah. just, it's just an amazing feeling as bad as that sounds and yeah. it's easy to get stuck on. Yeah. Welcome to Rick's Redemption, where we are family owned and operated. We strive in cleanliness, honesty and customer appreciation. Rick's Redemption is a recovery-ready employer who believes wholeheartedly in redemption. Here at Rick's, we support Recovery Rustic and definitely are proud to recover loud. God bless. Anderson's Auto Repair, locally owned and operated in Sweden, Maine, specializes in all make, all model vehicle diagnosis and repair. Each individual service is backed by our nationwide TechNet, two-year, 24,000-mile warranty. Call or stop in to schedule an appointment today. Anderson's Auto, for wherever the road takes you. I recover thou, here to tell my own story. I recover proud, save a life of like 40. I recover thou, yeah, I recover thou. I recover thou, yeah, I recover thou. I recover, I recover loud, I recover, I recover loud.